Good morning and welcome to the Middle East Institute's annual Syria conference. I'm Charles Lister, a senior fellow here at MEI, where I direct our programs on Syria and counterterrorism. It is my great pleasure to be hosting today's agenda, consisting of three stellar panels of esteemed Syrians, practitioners and experts. But it's also with a very heavy heart that we're gathering here today to talk about a crisis that began a decade ago, when men, women and children took to the streets to call at the time for political reform, only to be met with tear gas and bullets. Ten years later, there really can be no underestimating the consequences of Syria's crisis. It has transformed the world in ways that no other conflict has done in decades. The unprecedented exodus of refugees towards Europe in 2015 arguably catalyzed an international surge in far-right populism that rippled all the way to the United States. Emboldened Brexit provoked disunity within the European Union and challenged transatlantic ties like never before. Syria's neighbors, meanwhile, all US allies continue to face the immeasurable strains imposed by refugee populations that have expressed no sign of willingness to return unless substantive political change is realized at home. The rise of ISIS gave way to a years long wave of terrorist, terrorist attacks, resulted in a further erosion of nation state borders in the Middle East and Africa, exacerbated ethnic and sectarian tensions in multiple hotspots worldwide, mobilized the most expansive multinational military coalition in modern history, and created conditions in which NATO's second largest standing army, Turkey, is now more at odds with the alliance than in unity with it. Though the US-led coalition may have defeated ISIS's territorial caliphate in March 2019, the jihadist group is now resurging in areas controlled by Syria's regime, where the group has increased operationally every month for a year now. It appears now only a matter of time before ISIS attempts to take and hold territory again. The international norm against the use of chemical weapons was not just flouted on several occasions by Syria's regime, but nearly 340 times. Iran, meanwhile, found the time and space to expand its destabilizing behaviors further than ever before, and Russia has been granted the foothold it needed to begin challenging America's alliances and exploiting conflicts and vulnerable governments in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and further afield. In Syria itself, the human cost of the war and the unrestrained brutality of Bashar al-Assad's regime has been palpably clear. Over 500,000 Syrians have been killed, more than 100,000 remain missing, and nearly 12.5 million people, over half the population, have fled their homes. Years of regime carpet bombing has left over 50% of the country's basic infrastructure destroyed or unusable, and there is no prospect for any meaningful reconstruction. Meanwhile, rife corruption, warlordism, mismanagement, and government incompetence have left the economy in tatters. More than 90% of Syrians now live under the poverty line, and inflation, exacerbated by a financial crisis next door in Lebanon, has seen the Syrian pound crash to nearly 4,000 to a single US dollar today. Domestic economic strife is now giving way to tensions within the regime's elite and stimulating rising and arguably unprecedented levels of public discontent within communities that have long stood by the regime throughout the war. This is why we're still here today. The costs are clear and they are not going away. 10 years on, the human toll is simply immeasurable and there is no end in sight. All of the root causes of the uprising remain in place today and almost all are now worse than they were in 2011. With that spiraling economic crisis, corruption, warlordism and no meaningful diplomatic movement, the crisis is far, far from over. And yet despite that, international interest and investment in work aimed towards a just and sustainable resolution has arguably never been harder to come by. With a new administration in town here in Washington, D.C., all eyes are focused on what comes next. In foreign capitals and in the United Nations, there is some hope that President Biden and his team will revitalize diplomacy on Syria. But with the policy review still underway, things remain somewhat unclear and quiet. That I, that, I think, explains why, despite substantial effort, it has proved impossible to secure a single U.S. government official to speak at any of today's proceedings. With time, however, I'm hopeful and I'm sure we will have many opportunities to do so, and MEI's Syria program intends to lead the way. For now, I've spoken 
for far too long. I'm truly excited to hear from the upcoming panel made up of five remarkable Syrians whose thoughts on the past decade and the years to come, I know from years of personal experience, could not be worth uh, could not be more worth listening to. So without further ado, let me hand over to Clarissa Ward of CNN, uh, who will be kicking things off. Hi, Charles. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for what promises to be a really thoughtful and important conversation uh, about an anniversary that could not be any more important. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years of endless violence and bloodshed, and yet the best case scenario at the moment seems to be for what some call no war, no peace. That obviously is not a sustainable situation. And what I'm hoping we're gonna do through the course of today, um, through talking to our wonderful guests who I'll introduce momentarily, is take a moment to reflect on the last 10 years on how we got to the point we're at and what point we are at right now, what that looks like, how that can potentially be translated into something more positive for the Syrian people who deserve so much more than what they currently have. So um, I think we have three of our guests. Two of them are not, I have not arrived yet because um, as people in the US know, the US changed their clocks uh, today or last night, but the rest of the world did not. <laughs> so there may have been some confusion about um, the timing of this panel for our international guests, but hopefully they will be joining us momentarily. But let me start out by introducing who we do have here. Um, and we have some really fantastic people to discuss this issue. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Dahir Sahlul, who is the founder and president of Med Global, and many of you will be familiar with his work inside uh, northern Syria, particularly rebel-held areas. He has been doing extraordinarily brave work uh, for many years now, taking risks that um, most would only dream to take and um, really pulling into sharp focus the suffering of the Syrian people. And we're also joined by Rafif Shujati, who is also very well known and respected among all of us who follow Syria. And Rafif holds a number of positions right now, including uh, being a non-resident scholar with MEI, the director of the Foundation to Restore Equality and Education in Syria, and uh, a member of the Syrian Women's Political Network. And I'm excited to talk about that, Rafif, because this is a real area of you know, only semi-tapped potential. Um, and we're also joined by Labib Nahas, who I have had the pleasure of knowing for many years. Uh, Labib was the former program director of the Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity, which is an organization that works to promote, protect, and secure the rights of Syrian refugees and internally displaced people, wherever they may be. And I see we have now been joined as well by another one of our esteemed guests, um, and that is Sinam Sharkani Mohammed. And Sinam is a representative of the Syrian Democratic Council to the United States. She is also a top diplomat of the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria in Syria. And she serves on the SDC Presidential Council. So we have really a wide array of people with different backgrounds um, who will be able, able to offer, I hope, different perspectives on the reality of Syria today and the you know, intense trauma of the last 10 years. I thought though that we'd just start out with Zahir because you have just been inside Northern Syria. Just break it down for us. What is the situation like on the ground? What did you see? How have things changed? Have there been any improvements? Uh, good morning for everyone and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for MAI and Charles Lister. Thank you, Clarissa, for the introduction and for I'm really looking forward to hear the other guests uh, to what they uh, want to add. But I just came back from northern Syria um, last week uh, and this is part of uh, our humanitarian and medical mission. This time, Med Global has been helping to build uh, oxygen um, generators in uh, some of the hospitals in Idlib uh, to counteract, to uh, deal with the COVID crisis that has been hitting Syria hard on top of everything else. Uh, so we looked at uh, some of the hospitals that were dealing with COVID patients. Luckily, at this time, the number of COVID patients are very low in Idlib, uh, but uh, they were hit hard a couple of months ago where every hospital, every ICU bed 
uh, were busy, were occupied by COVID patients. Um, some of them died, unfortunately. The numbers that we see on the news, the official numbers, do not reflect the real numbers because of the low testing. Um, in spite of that, uh, you know, people were resilient. Hospitals were dealing with the crisis very well, and they were able to uh, accommodate the patients, treat them. And many patients elected to stay at home, to be treated at home, because there is no capacity whatsoever to treat these patients in the hospitals. Idlib has one of the lowest uh, number of beds per population and number of physicians per population in many uh, other low-income countries countries and middle income countries in the world. Uh, and I'm sorry to focus on Idlib as if that is separate entity from Syria, but it's actually a separate entity at this point from Syria. There's 4.2 million people who live in, in Idlib and, nor and north of Syria. Um, half of them have been displaced from other places uh, in Syria, from Homs, from Luta, from Dara, uh, from north of Homs, from Hama, uh, Aleppo, of course, and there is Zor and other places. I visited uh, two uh, camps for the displaced, uh, and these are two, one, uh, two out of 1,250 camps for the displaced. 1,250 camps for the displaced. There's about 1.2 million people who are living in tents in these camps. Uh, one of these camps that I visited called a Zuhura camp near Jarablus. Jarablus is in the eastern edge of the Euphrates Shield. Uh, and it's in the middle of nowhere. It has 3,000 families who were originally displaced from the city of Homs, my city, uh, from al -Wa'ar, after they were under siege for a long time by the Assad regime. Eventually, they were displaced to this um, camp in nowhere. Um, the situation is really hard. Uh, I've seen children who had asthma uh, because of the dust uh, and, and, and the poor situation and the cold also. It's very cold in that area. Um, one of the pharmacists told me that they have scarcity of medications to treat uh, chronic illnesses like hypertension and diabetes. I've seen elderly uh, who um, don't have uh, access to their medications, who are living there now for the past four years. This uh, community were displaced in 2017. I visited another um, camp for the displaced where I met last year. Uh, I, I was last year in Idlib. Um, during the peak of the uh, displacement related to the bombing of Assad and Russia of southern Idlib. And at that time, there was about 1.2 million people who were displaced, according to the UN. They are still displaced. None of them went back to the cities that right now under the control of the Assad regime, cities like Ma'arat al Norman, like Saraqib, uh, like Khan Sheikhoun. And Khan Sheikhoun, as we remember, is the site of a chemical weapon attack by Assad a few years ago. Uh, so uh, another camp I met with uh, this girl, her name is Asma. Uh, last time I met with her, uh, she was displaced with her family from northern Hama seven times until she reached that camp. And I asked her last time what she would like to be in the future. And she told me a doctor. Uh, this time, unfortunately, she's not going to school because she has to work with her family every day uh, to collect uh, some vegetables from the nearby farm and able to sustain her, her living with her family. And as we know, many children who are going to, uh, who are not going to school in Idlib and other places. Um, the displaced are still displaced. Um, there is now this sense that these uh, two point plus million people who are displaced in Idlib and Northern Syria are gonna be staying there for a long time. Uh, there's still um, camps and tents, but it looks like they are now uh, more projects to build homes. Uh, so many people think that Idlib and north of Syria would become like Gaza, uh, where you have normalization of displacement. Uh, and eventually these camps will become communities and, uh, and cities and villages. Um, and this will add to the stress on the population uh, in that area. Um, there's also signs of uh, resilience, of course. Uh, I've seen more children going to school because there is not much intensive bombing like uh, I witnessed last year uh, for many reasons. Um, there are more uh, people who are going uh, to uh, businesses to create businesses uh, in spite because of this window of opportunities of no bombing. I've seen women uh, who are uh, working in the streets, uh, who are building uh, uh, businesses, uh, who are going to school. I've seen more nurses and doctors in the hospitals. Um, one of the hospitals in particular in Darkush, which is northwest of Idlib, 
they're doing procedures that we do not do in my hospital in Chicago. It's amazing for me, the resilience of the Syrian community and the fact everywhere. And in the, the fact that if you give them a chance and if you give them some freedom, and I, of course, the situation in Idlib and north of Syria from the political perspective is not perfect. If you give them that chance, they will build things. They will build their communities. Um, so they were doing these procedures for uh, children who have deformities in their foot. Uh, they were doing artificial limbs uh, in, in, in these communities for uh, people who uh, need uh, these procedures in spite of the fact they are under siege, in spite of the fact there's uh, a prospect looming that this cross-border relief that is where you have humanitarian assistance coming from Turkey to northwest of uh, uh, Syria through this one border crossing called uh, Bab el Hawa can be stopped anytime. The Russian uh, ambassador to the UN said that they will veto the renewal of this uh, cross-border relief um, when it comes to be renewed in July of this year. That means you will starve these 4.2 million people. Uh, you put them under the mercy of the Assad regime. And we have known over the past 10 years, Clarissa, um, what happens when you put population under the mercy of the Assad regime. We've seen the pictures of children with severe malnutrition in Madaya and Zabadani in East Ghouta, where the Assad regime have blocked all UN um, convoys or most of them to these communities. According to the UN reports, 90% of these convoys were blocked by the Assad regime. It's to continue to block uh, humanitarian assistance northeast of Syria, uh, as uh, probably Sinan will, um, will talk about. Uh, but this is the current situation. Uh, people are unsure of their future. You know, we talk in, 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 in medicine and health about PTSD and psychological trauma for children in particular. And I always put this picture uh, to remember what happened in Syria because, you know, this is the 10th anniversary of Syria. And this is a drawing of a child uh, in Syria, uh, 10th grade child um, who was in Idlib last time I was with you in, in this panel, uh, Clarissa was about, uh, not in Idlib, in Aleppo. Uh, and this child is drawing the barrel bombing that is destroying his home um, and causing mutilation and death of children uh, in Syria. The children who are alive are crying and the children who are dead, uh, they're smiling. Um, 55,000 children were killed in Syria, according to a recent report. Uh, a Syrian child has lost 13 years of life expectancy. Um, there's every day since the last, the beginning of this crisis in March 15, 2011, three children on average were killed in Syria. So this, the scale of the crisis, uh, the fact that you have 600,000 people died in Syria, which is 2.7% of the population is unheard of in any other conflict. And in spite of that, we do not have um, uh, any uh, uh, clear signs from the Biden's administration that Syria is a priority for them in foreign policy. Uh, this is to me the most hurtful thing as Syrian American who've been witnessing this crisis uh, and, and going back and forth to Syria, meeting with our senators, meeting with State Department officials, meeting with the National Security Council staff, telling them what's going on in the Syria and the fact that what's happening in Syria is affecting us here in the United States. The anti-refugee sentiment, the anti-immigrant sentiment, the rise of hate group, the rise of terrorism, um, uh, the rise of populist parties, including the election of certain politicians here in the United States are all related to Syria. Syria has changed the world. So if we do not care about the 600,000 people who were killed in Syria, and the 11 million people who are displaced in Syria, we should care about us, about our national security. And Syria is affecting our national security and the politics in the US. Thank you so much. And I think you've provided an excellent kind of uh, situation report of where things are now. And, and something particularly interesting that you touched on that we're gonna discuss more is this idea of, of going home. And, and can people go home? And will it ever be possible for them to go home? Or are we normalizing, as you said, with the Gaza analogy, are we, are we normalizing this, um, these tent cities that have um, sprung up across Northern Syria? One housekeeping note I should have made at the beginning, if you want to ask a question, we will try to get to Q&A. Um, and I, there's a little box there, Q&A, put your question 
in the box and I will try my very best to, to get at it. Um, so I wanted to just start now, you know, we'll come back to a lot of the themes that you've just brought up, which are so important and particularly the resilience of the Syrian people. But I wanted for all of us to kind of go back in our time machines 10 years for a moment. And I wonder, Rafif, if we could start out by talking about what this uprising originally looked like. Who was a part of this uprising? Where was this born out of? Because there has been so much spin and so much kind of tampering with the narrative. Just from my own personal experience, very quickly, when I went to Syria in 2011, and I remember going to a protest and meeting with activists, and there were Alawites among those activists, a young Alawite girl. There was a Christian girl among those activists as well. And they were all bound by this idea of, you know, enough is enough basically and demanding a better future. But somewhere along the line, things clearly changed a lot. And certainly the perception in the world of the makeup of the opposition changed a lot. So I wonder if Eve, if you could just tell us a little bit about how the opposition started out. What was this originally about? Well, this was and continues to be about freedom, dignity, and democracy. So many people may remember when school children scrawled graffiti on their school walls, they would have been inspired by other Arab Spring movements, and they said, Jacques Doria, doctor. They were being flip. They were demanding an end to corruption. They were pointing to other dictators who had been basically killed. Uh, those kids were jailed and tortured. And that set off a match that ignited the Syrian uprising. I would say from based on my experience back then, having served as a, a spokesperson and representative for the local coordination committees in Syria, uh, that was the largest network of secular nonviolent activists. And we helped coordinate the peaceful demonstrations. Uh, it's a very good reminder that for about seven months, demonstrations were entirely peaceful. Uh, people chanted slogans. They handed flowers to soldiers who were sent to shoot live ammunition at them. Many of these protesters were university students or younger teenagers, children, who were out demanding a better future than their parents and grandparents had had. So this was really the start of it. Uh, part of the resilience of Syrians is that even if you fast forward to today, there are still principles of nonviolence circulating among civil society, among different communities within Syria. You still see protests today when the skies are clear, when people can get out and signal their demand for freedom, dignity, democracy. That part has not changed. So just briefly, you know, to respond to that, when did things change? I mean, because, you know, I understand what you're saying that there still exists this, you know, more um, inclusive secular opposition, but certainly at a certain moment, the, com the complexion of the opposition did palpably and visibly change. What do you attribute that to? Well, I attribute that to a, a couple of different things. From a, a civilian perspective, the right to self-defense absolutely has to be acknowledged. And I think people were growing increasingly frustrated with holding funerals, which would turn into uh, 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 more funerals because the regime would come and shoot at the, the mourners. Uh, on the other hand, you also have a regime play. Uh, the regime wanted to drive a point that it was Assad or the Islamists. And when the Assad regime released jihadists from the jails in late 2011 and sent them into the demonstrations as disruptors, this is when the makeup started to change a little bit. This is when other countries started getting more involved. Gulf countries were starting to funnel money into Syria to arm members, of, to, to create an armed opposition. And this is when the tide began turning against sort of the nonviolent thread that had been going through Syria, across Syria. And as you mentioned, Clarissa, this was, this was a, a non-sectarian uprising. This was Christians and Alawis and Sunnis and everything, everybody, right? Because freedom had to be universal in Syria and the demand was always freedom for all. Sinam, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this because, you know, 
people, when they talk about the sort of roots and the beginning of this uprising and looking back 10 years ago, the Kurdish factor was not as huge a part of it as it is now. I wonder from your perspective, uh, what was the Kurdish understanding of the beginning of this uprising and, and when did that start to change? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this panel. It's really very important to speak about the Syrian issue and Syrian crisis since a decade. We are not uh, having any solution so far. So uh, let me first, uh, when we go to the 2004, which is before the 2011, just it is on, uh, on 12th of March, just before the three days we celebrate that uh, day. The Kurdish people that time in Qamishli city, they started uprising because the Kurds people, they suffered a lot from the regime. We suffered from the tyranny. They, they prevent the Kurdish people from their uh, identity. They suffered from uh, the other chauvinist mentality, actually, sorry to, to say that, of the, that time. So we started our uprising in 2004, but that time nobody support us. So we were alone in the uh, uh, field, uh, uh, facing the regime. Uh, killing more than 40 people, Kurdish young and women people. And this uprising started from Parishli city to Kubani to Afrin, all the Kurdish area at that time. In 2011, we were there. We were there starting to organize the people as, as a Kurdish people first, because we are looking at the situation in Syria and we could uh, analyze what should, what will happen afterwards. We know the regime, it's very tough, very tyranny. It's, uh, you know, a regime uh, doesn't listen to anyone, authoritarian regime. So we know that. And we experienced 2004, what happened to us. And we started to have uh, organizing our people in the, in the Kurdish region, and then started to have the demonstration in all our cities. I was one of the people in 2011, I was the, uh, having the, in, uh, participating in the demonstration in the Aleppo city that time. And we faced a lot of difficulties there. After that, um, uh, unfortunately to say what happened to the Syrian crisis or revolution, as we call it, that all this, I think maybe Rafif or uh, Dr. He mentioned that all the jihadis be set free from the uh, presence. And then we have seen many of the Muslim brotherhood join this. So from this point, this uh, revolution of Syria has been changed. There was a turning point. They only, they have one vision, Islamic Sharia vision. They don't accept the other people in there. So for that, we say that this project, it will not last and we will not reach a solution with such a project. It is a sectarian uh, uh, regime and we need to have all the diversities inside Syria together. And this is what we did. In our regions, we have multi-nations, multi-religions. We have Christians, Syriac, Arabs, Muslim, Sunni, Yazidi, Alawite, all together. Instead of fighting each other as it is happening in the other part of Syria, we come together. All these people come together in our north, of, uh, north and northeast Syria, and we come, instead of fighting, we agree to a social contract, to administrate this region together, to have our services like education, hospitals, you know, 
uh, and even the political uh, uh, body there. And this is what we did. So we were a part of this Syrian revolution in a very different, uh, we can say, vision. Our vision was Syria as a democratic Syria, Syria is a unity of Syria through the diversity which we have it. And Syria to have to guarantee in the new constitution of Syria, the, the rights of all the people who are living in Syria, the rights of the Kurdish people and the rights of the women even in this constitution. Unfortunately, what we are seeing now in Syria I mean, I'm very sorry to say that what we reached after 10 years, we come out for dignity, for freedom, you know? All the Syrian people, they wanted that. But where is the dignity now? <laughs> we are now, millions of people have been refugees, 100,000 been displaced, uh, more than 500,000 been killed, and now we have divided Syria. If we look at the, the, the picture of, or the map of the Syria, we can see a divided Syria. And this is, we didn't want it. We want a united Syria, a united Syrian people together. This is what we need. But unfortunately, when the others, they don't accept the Kurdish people and they are looking at the Kurdish people as they are separatives, it divided Syria. When they look at the Kurdish people as if they want to build their own Kurdish state, it divided Syria. We were not looking for dividing Syria. We were not looking to have the Kurdish state in northern Syria. And what we look for building our own autonomous administration, decentralized Syria with the unity of Syria. So after that, if you look now, the regime controlled majority of the Syrian territory. But it, it did the regime now, he has a, I mean, he won? I don't think he won. In Syria, we have economic crisis. We have destroyed, I mean, the Syrian, most of the Syrian city being destroyed. People, they are now suffering from this economic and these sanctions and, you know, all this happening for the Syrian people. Actually, the ordinary Syrian people suffering from that. And even still, we, if we go to other places controlled by the Turkish, which is occupying, I, 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 for me, I say it is occupying Syrian territories in Jarablus, in Afrin, in Ras Rain, in Tel Aviv, or it is being occupied. Why we say occupied? When you go to these places, you will not feel that you are in a Syrian land. You will see the Turkish uh, uh, flags. You will see Mr. Erdogan's pictures. You will see the Turkification going on there everywhere in Afrin. I'm from Afrin, it is my city. My family has been displaced for the third time now. So Turkification is going there. Ethnic cleansing is going there killing the people for their identity as a Kurdish people. But if I, I, I ask it, who is killing these people in Africa? Who is kidnapping the women in Africa? Who is raping the women in Africa? Unfortunately, they are Syrian people. And they are the National Syrian Army, who is now working according to the Turkish agenda. They are not working anymore for the Syrian interest. And for that, I'm very sorry to say that. I studied or I spent all my life in Homs. I respect the Homs, Homs from the people of Homs. I love it. I lived in Homs for 11 years. For, for that, I feel that Homs is my city. And I, I was born in Damascus because my uncles are all from Damascus. So I, I feel that Damascus is my city also. And I am originally from Afrin, so it is my city. So for that, I say, all the Syrian cities, it means a lot for me. I don't want to divide Syria. I don't want to see the Afrin city has been, you know, uh, uh, occupied by the, another uh, Turkish and the groups who are working with Turkey actually, 
Unfortunately, they are Syrian groups. So where is the revolution? This is our mistakes as the Syrian people. We have to consider all this happening. We have to uh, uh, at least correct this lane. We have to correct it in order to reach a solution. 10 years is enough to see what's happened in Syria. Syrian people only, they are suffering inside Syria. My family, they are still in Syria and they are suffering there. My, my homes are in Africa being occupied by these people who are in Africa, the groups there. And they don't allow my family to go there. Why? Because they are Kurdish and accusing them to be with the SDF or with the SDC or with the autonomous administration. And this is because Turkey accusing them of that. And for that, I said that I will just let, you know, just before two years, my mother, she is 90 years old. She passed away. We couldn't take her body to Africa. None of our family could, could accompany the, company, the body to Africa. Why? They didn't allow us. We sent her body to some people who are from our place there just to make all the ceremony of her. So how I feel very careful for that. We are now Syrian here together. I hope that we were together, all the Syrian people at the Syrian uh, uh, dialogue, at the table of the Syrian uh, uh, peace talk. I hope we were there. But vetoes of Turkey didn't allow the SDC, Syrian Democratic Council to be at the table. And veto of Turkey didn't allow the autonomous administration representative to be at the table. And this is what we reach it now. We are not able to meet together. We are not able to be at the table to dialogue, to have a dialogue, the, the, the uh, peace talk together. We are as a Syrian. Mm. No, I but, think, listen, Sanam, you touch on such an important point there, which is the idea of, you know, is it possible to have a united Syria again? And Labib, I want to I wanna draw on your experience here. And I want to talk a little bit about the sort of Islamist piece of the puzzle, which, you know, Sanam was talking about that too. Um, and Rafif also alluded to it. And, you know, give us a sense that, you know, was this always an Islamist revolution in a sense? And is there a space in your mind for Syrians, whether they be Kurdish, Christian, Alawite, uh, Muslim, Sunni, Shia, whatever, to, live together again in Syria? Is, is that possible? I think, yes, it is possible. Oh, wait, sorry, Sanam, forgive me for interrupting you. I'm asking Labib, who is our other panelist. I'm so sorry. I will come back and get more thoughts from you, though. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Sinam, first rule of dialogue is to let the others talk as well, uh, Sinam. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of ground to cover for me here. And I, I, I'll try to be, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I'll try to touch on all these topics as fast as possible. So I'll start with your question, Clarissa, if, if it was an, an Islamic revolution or Islamist revolution from day one, definitely it, it wasn't. Uh, but I think we have to acknowledge the nature of the Syrian uh, society. This is key for us to understand. Syria is a conservative society. By that, I'm not saying it's Islamist in an ideological sense which later it was kind of, um, uh, it, was, it, it was a brush that used to paint the entire uh, revolution. That's not accurate. Yes, I agree after a certain uh, amount of time and probably in the early 2012, there was a clear definition of, of certain, um, especially armed groups uh, that took an ideological kind of foundation in order uh, to, to, to shape uh, their view and policies and, and work as well. But I, I think, you cannot describe the revolution in Syria as an Islamic or Islamist. It, it has the conservative values that society has. And we have to take into account that when Iran intervened, and, and now that we're mentioning Homs too much, I, I am from Homs, we remember very well that the sectarian tone went up. The, the sectarian crimes um, uh, against, against civilians in terms of uh, killing, raping, uh, taking over properties, etc. that went up a lot. 
And we have to keep in mind that Syria has been ruled by a sectarian regime for four decades when uh, the revolution started. So there is a background for average Syrian Muslims, conservative, not necessarily ideological, not necessarily Islamist, and definitely not necessarily jihadist are as, as they're being um, um, labeled. Uh, and we know that the word jihadist in Arabic and in the West have different uh, connotations, but definitely, definitely was a reflection of the identity of, 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 of the country. When people go to demonstrations, as, 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 as Rafi mentioned and others, waiting to be shot at. And we did that, I did that myself. I remember going to, to, the, to the Friday prayer and actually praying as if I am going to die. And all people who went that day there did the same. So you cannot expect people who are facing almost certain death not to resort to their faith. It happened in the US after 9-11 with like a sky high uh, levels of, and, and records of selling the Bible because there was something that shook the foundation of that nation the same way that shook the foundation of the Syrians. So, and, and if you add to that the fact that you were facing a sectarian regime, there's no way around it. It's not about minorities. It's not about dictatorship. It is a sectarian regime. And everyone who lived in Syria knows that exactly, knows that in their daily activities, in their daily life, the humiliation, the discrimination. So I think it was a reaction and it was a reflection of who we are. And I'm talking conservatives. Yes, later other things emerged. And, and, and for me, the, the emergence of Daesh was the biggest, the biggest blow to the revolution. Even though Daesh is, a, is an export to Syria and was born in Iraq. But yet I think one of the biggest low point of the revolution was when Daesh made presence in Syria. And we Syrians probably, we did not know how to handle that the best possible way. So I, I don't think we can brush the entire thing as an Islamist, nor we can consider the, the emergence of the Muslim Brotherhood as, 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 as an act of hijacking the, 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 the revolution. The revolution remained on course in terms of the demands that we had originally. I remember the first demonstration we had in Homs when we arrived to the uh, city center, we just said, okay, so what do we ask for now? And we asked for reforms, we asked for rights, we asked for the release of Tal Maluhi, which is a, a young lady activist that was 15 years old or 18. Please don't quote me on that because I'm not sure. When she was arrested before the revolution for writing some blogs online. So I think that part has to be clear. Another thing that probably I will touch quickly on, on, on what Sinam said, I totally disagree on, on, on the narrative on how things happen. And especially, I, I don't like really to separate Kurds from Syrians. I don't think that there's any body entitled to talk in the name of any group in Syria, nor the Muslim Brotherhood or any Islamist body can talk on behalf of all Muslims in Syria. And the same way, I don't think that one body can claim to represent the Kurds. I think we have to think as Syrians, as a one. I, I, I really get irritated a lot of times when I hear the, the customary statement after having region, regional or international meetings between countries where they, they, they state like, um, we have to preserve uh, the unity and integrity of the Syrian territory. There's no unity. Syria has been divided. Our, our target, our objective has to be to unify Syria again. And the unification starts from here, from us Syrian, not waiting for other countries to do it on our behalf because they're not gonna do it. It has to start from within us, but we have to change the narrative. The narrative that I just heard is not a narrative that helps in that discussion because it is not accurate and the other uh, uh, reason is because it deepens the entrenchment that we have each party in its own position. All the violations that uh, Sina mentioned, uh, I am against them and I condemn them. And I'm not saying they don't happen. I think some of that happens, but very similar stuff happens on the other side. And I can talk about how, how, how Arabs uh, uh, are being forced and displaced out of their homes in, in East Syria. I can talk about uh, violations of human rights, 
uh, I can't talk a lot, a lot of issues that they're very contentious and it's not my intention to go in that direction, but we have to set the record straight. I think if we keep under the excuse that Turkey is saying that or this, we keep entrenching ourselves even deeper, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, when, when in 2004, uh, 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 Kurdish Syrians uh, have their, their, their own uprising against the regime, the reason why they were not backed up, not because people did not want to back them up, and this is very important, because people were scared. And I can guarantee you, if it wasn't that in 2011, we had the Arab Spring and people in Syria, before they moved, before they marched, they were, they've been watching on television for three months with their own eyes, how three regimes fell and were toppled. That really prepared us psychologically to take that step. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. But I can tell you something else, Clarissa. I do not know a single Syrian that I worked with or interacted with that is against the rights of Kurdish people as Syrians, as part of our society. And I think this is the right context to put it forward. When you gain the support of Syrians for your injustices, for the treatment that you had over the years, then this is when the conversation will triumph. And this is why I believe if I want to move towards something more pragmatic, Yes, for us as Syrians, the relationship between the U.S. now that Dr. Zahar mentioned the new administration, the relationship between the U.S. and Turkey is key for us as Syrians. Unfortunately, we have foreign intervention in our country. I would love that my country was free of an intervention. Reality is the Syrian conflict is no longer Syrian. It's an international conflict. And the ripple effect of Syria literally, as you know, has changed societies in the West. So for us, we need our allies to have a strategy. And I think the biggest achievement that will change everything this year, if we can work on it and achieve it, is to have the Northwest, Northeast and East of Syria unified. If we're talking about unifying Syria, then this is the first step. I know it looks ludicrous right now, it looks impossible, but I think we Syrians have to push for that, but we have to stay away from that narrative. And we have to take out of the equation the extreme elements on both sides, but especially on the side that actually has control over the, over the area. And in that regard, we Syrians can push forward a solution and present it and, and make a middle ground for Turkey and the US to have an understanding over Syria, because that will open up, uh, I mean, sorry, the current situation is not sustainable. This is very important. So what we're talking about right here, and Sinam knows about it pretty well, we cannot continue in this situation. We might exist for further time, but definitely we're not giving Syrian citizens nor the life quality, nor the dignity that they deserve. If we can solve this conundrum that we have, and it's up to us Syrians to do it, then we can open up all this area to investment, reconstruction, better life, job opportunities. But most importantly, we will give the world and the Syrians a model different to the Assad model, and that model will be our highest political political capital that we will have moving forward. And Rafif, I see you've, you've got your hand up there, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, and your thoughts on the idea of whether it is feasible, whether it is possible for there to be a united Syria again. Thank you, Clarissa. I, I wanted to sort of come back to how the revolution started. I don't want to repeat history and I certainly don't want to repeat what my colleagues have said, but I do want to issue a general reminder that there are different sects in Syria. We all know that. It's a melting pot of cultures and religions. We all know that. We also all know that people are discriminated against equally when it comes to the regime. It's not whether you're Kurdish or Christian or Alawi that you have more or fewer freedoms. It's whether you are pro-regime or anti-regime. And I think a very successful tactic of the Assad regime has been to divide and conquer. We've talked about the resurgence of Daesh and we've talked about the jihadists. And I personally believe, and I think I speak for many Syrians that this was a regime construct so that it could further divide Syrians along sectarian lines. So it could create a narrative that the West bought wholly of it's us or Daesh. It's the devil you know, or this big bearded monolithic destructive force. 
As Syrians, we already know that the Assad regime was far more bloodthirsty than we saw from Daesh. And I, I believe they're, they're two devils of the same, of just who wear different uh, clothing, right? So I, I think it's important to remember that the origins of the revolution were for a united Syrian people, especially with the local coordination committees. Our charters were inclusive of all Syrians and that had nothing to do with ethnic background, culture, language, or religion. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Now, as we're looking forward in what's happening with this, uh, this situation called Syria, I, I wanna touch on something that Labib said, and that was about changing the model. And I think that what's been happening since 2014 through now is that Syrian civil society has taken on some prominence Women's groups have opened and expanded. Uh, the youth of Syria have fundamentally changed the mentality of that conservative Syria Labib was talking about. And I think what you have now in many situations, especially among Syrian refugees abroad and in expatriate communities, is a new vision of a free Syria. And I think that model should be encouraged because it can only make the existing one obsolete. And what I mean by that is we're seeing culture be taking on more prominence among in Syrian society. We're seeing women's political activism. We're seeing activism of different types, including what Sinan was alluding to in the Kurdish rights movement. Um, so I, I think we're seeing a generation of Syrians that is not afraid to express itself, that is willing to investigate the meaning of freedom, that is willing to have a negotiation on where my freedom begins and yours ends and vice versa. And I think we are now seeing a generation of Syrians that is looking to rebuild a different Syria. And I, I mean that more intellectually than physically, of course. So I just wanted to, to drive home those points. Yeah, no, I think those are really important points. Um and too often they're forgotten, right? Or they're kind of considered not as prominent as some of the, the sort of more hot button geopolitical issues. Um, and ultimately Syria is going to be rebuilt by Syrians, right? One way or, or another. Um, and again, it's too easy to lose sight of that. Um, Dr. Thahid, I wonder if you can try for a second to put on a hat, because you know, I know how personally involved you are in this conflict and how deeply you care. But if you're trying to look at this objectively, has Bashar al-Assad won this war? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a big question. I, I don't think so. I believe that the Syrian people uh, still have the spark of the uh, revolution in their hearts, uh, and that is increasing by the day. Um, we still have a lot of refugees, 5.6 million refugees. What I'm seeing actually from the diaspora community and also from the people in Idlib and North Syria and you know, my families are in areas that are controlled by the, the regime. I hear the news from Dara and Sueda and even the restlessness in uh, communities in Altus and Latakia. I think the revolution uh, is still there, although I don't like to speak in a political language. Um, my sons, all of them are, and, 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 and the daughter and wife are all involved in the uh, Syrian issue uh, somehow. Um, the second generation of Syrians who are living in the West whether it's in Europe or in, in the United States or Canada uh, or Australia, and I know many of them are quite attached to the Syrian um, values and aspiration of democratic, uh, multicultural Syria. Uh, people in China wanted to live uh, in a place that is united, that is democratic and multicultural, in spite of the challenges that Sinan and Labib and uh, Rafif asserted to. I don't think that he won. Uh, dictators do not win. Uh, justice eventually win. Uh, he might have won some territories, uh, although I think this is uh, I mean, debatable. Uh, most of the population live outside of the control of the Assad regime. Uh, if we accounted for uh, um, people in the north, northwest uh, and uh, refugees, um, he might have won some of the propaganda wars. And I, I think this is very important to address the fact that we have, and I'm looking at the questions and the 
comments coming the people in the yeah West unfortunately we're getting more comments than questions and if i could just chime in really quickly and say please you know i i don't we don't need to three pages on what you think about Syria. Just one question for our guests would be great. Sorry, continue, doctor. So, um, I mean, the fact that we have a representative from Hawaii who met with the Assad regime, and she thinks she did not condemn his crimes. The fact that we have people like Max Blumenthal, and Rania Khalif, and Ben Norton, and others in the left uh, who basically um, the fact that they're supporting the dictator who kills children and gasses them while they are asleep and they're fighting the aspiration, the democratic aspiration and the agency of the Syrian people. Uh, this propaganda should be addressed that is fed by Russia, by Russia today, by uh, some people in the left that is causing this. Every time we talk, I talk about Syria and talk about it, someone will, 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 will stand and will tell me, uh, I, I thought that uh, the white helmet are uh, Salafis or supported by jihadists, and that doctors in Aleppo are Salafis. This nonsense that infiltrated our media is something that to, to be addressed. The fact that, for example, some programs in CNN were fixated on Iran instead of talking about Syria, in spite of the scale of the crisis. These issues have to be addressed. The fact we, we have many people in the American public invested in Syria. I mean, Rabbi Andrea London, she's a rabbi of, rabbi of synagogue in Chicago. She prays with her community about the Syrian people every week, and she sent me assuring messages. Um, um, Dr. Uh, Conrad Fisher, who is the head of the department in New York, he went to me and in, spite, in front of the United Nations to, to protest the brutality of the Assad regime. Uh, Reverend uh, Greg Livingston, um, who, who's a Baptist uh, priest, uh, who also went with me and he wrote a letter to President Obama, you know, all of these people in the American public who invested in Syria, Mark Nelson, a teacher uh, in a small uh, city in, in Illinois who, uh, who, who draws pictures about the Syrian children. And in spite of that, we have this kind of apathy among our policymakers to address this issue uh, that is humanitarian, that is moral, uh, that is clear injustices that happen to the Syrian children. Okay, I mean, I agree that we have some disagreements about people maybe in this platform, but don't we agree that Syrian children, is, whether they are Kurdish or Assyrian or uh, Circassian or Christians or Alawite or Sunnis or Arab or Kurds deserve a better future? I mean, I think that should be the focus of not, not only Syrians, but the international community. We are forgetting, you know, last time I was in, in the platform with you, um, uh, Clarissa, in the United Nations talking about Aleppo. I asked the, the, the members of the Security Council at that time to save the life of one child. Her name was Sarab. She was 11 years old. She was bombed with a barrel bomb uh, by the Assad regime. Everyone knew that. Um, and she had a brain uh, bleeding. She was in the hospital in Aleppo. I asked the whole power of the United Nations Security Council to save the, the life of Sarab, and they did not intervene to save the life of children. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that, you know, we have the chief of staff, uh, at uh, that time in uh, uh, President Obama's administration, Dempsey, uh, sending a letter that it will cost us $1 billion every month to protect the Syrian civilians. We spent more than uh, $100 billion uh, since the letter that he wrote uh, in humanitarian assistance, in wars against ISIS, and call all kinds of things. I'm talking about the United States only, not Europe or other countries, uh, because we are putting these band-aids on the crisis. Why don't we address it for once in a while? I mean, the United Nations Security Council stipulated a pathway for peace, for justice, for return of refugees, for reconstruction, for political change, 2254. I think that should be the focus of the Biden's administration. Biden should be leading on Syria. Why is he not leading on Syria? I mean, it pains me to see now in Myanmar, for example, peaceful, who are, peaceful demonstrators who are killed every day by snipers. This is how the Syrian crisis started, by a peaceful demonstrator who are killed every day by snipers. And the reason that the Myanmar army is killing people by snipers is because we allowed the Assad regime to kill people by snipers. Uh, mm. You know, this is terrible. Um, and I, I think there's many things that should be talked about in, in this platform. And I know that the time is not right, but I think our focus should be the future of Syria and the future of the region and the future of the Syrian uh, children because if Syria is allowed to have democratic multicultural society, that will change the whole Middle East. Syrians are entrepreneurs, like Palestinians, like Lebanese, like Jordanian. They want to build. They want to build hospitals. We build hospitals underground because communities wanted 
to have health care. We build hospitals in caves that did not happen in any, in any other community or any other countries because doctors wanted to provide health care to their communities. We build schools underground, colleges for nurses underground in Aleppo and other places. These uh, stories of resilience, of strength, of people wanted to live in spite of the bombing, of the barrel bombing, of the uh, gas attacks with sarin gas and chlorine gas has to be identified by the policymakers. Until now, when I meet with my senator, he doesn't know what's the difference between the Kurds and the Arabs in Syria after 10 years of conflict. This is really despicable. Not yeah. what happened in Syria, but what's happening in the United States. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, you raise an excellent point. I know it's a point that will be addressed in, in the next panel, certainly, especially. Um, but Sanam, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you've, you've heard everyone on this panel say it's possible for there to be a multicultural democratic uh, future united Syria. Some of the questions that are starting to come in are saying, why is that even necessary? Is that a good idea, given everything that's happened, given the realities on the ground, the inevitable bloodshed that, that could it be sort of a, a consequence of even trying to have that project? You know, what's your thought on this? Is, is it realistic to have a united democratic Syria or is it more pragmatic, if not desirable, to have a kind of situ situation where you might have seven or eight cantons or sort of semi-autonomous states? Yeah. Uh, I would like first, I mean, to, when I talk about what uh, happened, I'm talking about the reality now. What is on the ground now? This is what I, I, mean, I would, I want to, to describe the picture as it is now we have it, so that we can reach to a solution. If you did not fix it, the, 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 the disease or the reality, what is it? You will not find the solution. And this is what we have now. It is a reality. I know that the regime is sectarian, I know the regime, they used some uh, uh, religions or something like jihadis or terrorist groups to be all the opposition will be that as it is this in order to say, oh, I'm here, I will uh, fight the, the terrorists. I know that. But if you look now what's going on in 2012, in 2012, I'm talking. In 2012, these groups coming to us line. And then they were threatening the Kurdish people again. So for that, I'm talking about this in the reality. So now how can we reach to a solution? The Assad, of course, he, he have controlled uh, or he regained the territory of Syrian uh, land, but he did not win. If you win military, that doesn't mean you win politically. And Syria will not be at the Syria before 2011. 10 years of the people and killing the people, suffering all this will not go in vain. So for that, we will not be having an option, either Assad or this opposition, no. Or what I'm talking, opposition, which is now uh, uh, like, you know, Islamist, uh, killing the people, they don't recognize the others. This is what I'm talking. But of course there are hope. There are hopes with the democratic opposition. Democratic opposition, they are there in Syria. Many of them, they are there. We as the Syrian Democratic Council, we reached to many figures, such figures, who accepted to have the decentralized system for Syria, who accepted to have the democratic Syria, who accepted to have the, the, the rights of Kurds, Syria, whatever, because Syria, it is a noise multi-religion, multi-nations in Syria. We can't, I mean, ignore it. So this is what we need now. We, we have to reach together as the Syrian people to be at the table and to discuss our problem together. As a Syrian Democratic Council, we reach to many of the Syrian opposition. And we were talking with them some of them, they didn't want to actually to, to reach us or to talk to us. They didn't. 
And I am now just telling now in front all the people who are witnessing. We try to reach it, they don't want. Accusing the SDC as a Kurdish separatist. Accusing the SDF, the, the forces that defeated the most brutal groups, ISIS in the world with the help of United States and the Global Commission. And I am very, I mean, uh, thankful for the United States to help in that. We paid 11,000 of our people in Northeast Syria in order to defeat ISIS. But we didn't defeat ISIS there in the Syrian for the Kurdish people only. It is for the sake and the interest of all the Syrian people. If we didn't do that, you will find now ISIS will be in all over Syria and all the Syrian people will be like sexual slaves as it happened for the Yazidi people in Shangal in north of Iraq. We so, did that. We did it for the Syrian people, for the sake of the Syrian people. So we have to sit together. We as the SDC, we are excluded from the Syrian peace talk. Yes. We are the SDC, we are excluded from the, the Constitution Committee. So we have to be there in order to reach to each other, to, okay. to, to continue speaking at the Syrian issue. This is what we need. And this is what I think when uh, uh, Mr. Sahlul and uh, Mr. Nahas, he said, okay, Syria, we have to be together. Yes, I agree with that. We have to accept each other, but we will not, we will not agree to be or to return back at the Syria before 2011. We will not. Okay, let, let me interrupt we, you for a moment there. Sinam, because our other and guest has just arrived. Yeah. Okay. So Excuse just me. let me have one yes. minute. We have to ask the, the, the U.S. here to, I mean, that we will have to be all at the table to engage in the Syrian issue. And this is very important. And all of, all of our panelists, they say that it is not the priority now for Syria issue. And this is, we have to end the bloodshed and united and the Syrian democratic opposition come together to build a new Syria, democratic, decentralized Syria, having the rights for all the Syrian people. And this is what we need to reach with. No, Thank and you. I think you're, listen, you're touching on a very important point here, which is, you know, whether the Syrian people should be allowed to decide the future of their country or whether this should be in the hands of superpowers and who gets a seat at the table and who has a say in the future of Syria. And I know that this is a hugely um, disturbing issue for many people in the Kurdish parts of the country who feel that they're not, they're not being given a seat at the table and their voices aren't being heard. So I thank you for sharing that perspective. I'm delighted that our fifth panelist has joined us. Um, uh, Nadal Al-Shar, uh, Dr. Nadal Al-Shar, who was the former Minister of Economy and Trade in Syria. He left the Syrian cabinet in 2012, and he is currently the Secretary General of the Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions. Thank you so much for joining us as well. And um, I'm afraid you sort of haven't heard some of the, the stuff we've been discussing. So I'm gonna just throw you in at the deep end here and ask you a question that I've asked some of our panelists already, which is, has Bashar al-Assad won the Syrian civil war? And do you, is it possible for there to be a united Syria once again? Thank you, Klaus. I'm, I'm sorry I was late and I was in travel and I got things messed up in terms of timing. Uh, I'm glad to be here, very happy to be invited. Uh, let me just clear something up before I start answering your question and talking about the issues that I'm concerned about. This is pretty much the first time for me appearing in public, actually. I've avoided and uh, refrained from uh, being in public in the past, a fear of uh, misinterpretations, misunderstandings, accusations, and uh, so it was safer for me and for the whole scene for me to be aside. I think today the situation is pretty much different. Uh, looks like um, we're having some problem 
uh, with uh, Dr. Alshar's internet. Um, so hopefully he will be able to join us um, again soon, but rather because I'm concerned that, that time is of the essence here. Um, and so rather than waiting for him to, uh, oh, oh, you're back. I'm afraid we, we had lost you for a moment there. So uh, uh, this is my situation and I'm describing what I'm going through in my mind, in my uh, psychology. And I think to, to rescue Syria, you need a different uh, narrative. You need a different approach. You need different language. Um, okay. I'm not sure what we can do about this. It's so unfortunate because I really want to hear what, um, what he has to say, but it appears that there's a problem with the internet. I don't know if you can hear me at all, Nadal, but if you maybe try to turn off your video and um, at least then we could just hear your voice and we might be able to hear it more clearly because we can't really hear you at the moment. I don't know Charles or if someone from MEI, if you might sh shoot him a direct message. Can you hear me, Nadal? It's not really victorious for anyone. I think we are all losers in this catastrophe. So talking about victory today is really completely in my, in my mind, over 90% of people are, are under the, the poverty line way before under the poverty line. Okay, um, I'm going to have to move on just because we can't really hear properly what's being said. And Labib, I wanted to ask you about another crucial component to this that we've kind of touched on, but um, the idea of refugees internally displaced people, when can they go home? Can they go home? Is that a sort of- Are you hearing me? I'm afraid, uh, sorry, you can hear me now. I couldn't hear you because your internet, I think is not very good. But if you try speaking now, can I just hear without the video if it's better? Are you able to hear me? I think you're on mute. Hello? Yes. Can you talk now? And perhaps I can hear you now that your video is gone. Are you there? Can you hear me? Um, I Okay, this appears to be <laughs> not a salvageable situation. So Labib, sorry, if I can ask you again about the refugee question. Oh, you're on mute as well, Labib. Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Sure. Okay. So I, I think this is probably the most crucial question that we have because in Syria, we're living in an unprecedented situation where half, more than half of the population is, is has been displaced, you know. So um, uh, I, I think that the, the conditions and, and the environment for Syrian refugees and displaced people to go back is far from being there. And this is a very key issue that governments, especially Western governments, has to understand. Um, we believe that the issue of safe environment, which is, which is being so far used as a very loose term, an undefined term, is the key for the political solution. And that has to be clear because all other efforts are not going to serve the real purpose of getting people back. Um, uh, and I'm mentioning this because as we move forward and, 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 and as, a, as we see the result and the impact of the displacement, and actually as, as the uh, Norwegian uh, uh, Council for Refugees just published a study a few days ago where they're saying that another 6 million uh, Syrians will be displaced in the next 10 years unless there's a sustainable solution. So this, the, the, the impact, the gravity of the situation has not stopped. We have not yet uh, reached the end of, of the catastrophe. It, it can get worse. So that's why I believe that working on, on, on a safe environment, starting with the definition of a safe environment, because every time we talk about constitution, about elections, about any components of the 2254 resolution or any political solution in the future, we keep mentioning that we need the safe environment. So why not focusing on the safe environment first? Let's define it. 
let's understand it. Let, let's allow the Syrians themselves to define it because ultimately Syrians are the ones who have to make the decision to pack their bags and go back home and face the consequences once they are at home. So we believe that safe environment is the, the entry point for any political solution in the future and for any component of that solution uh, would it be to happen in, in, uh, in the future. One, one more thing probably, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll touch on it very quickly. And, and it's what uh, Sinam said before. I think they should be more concerned about the Syrians' perception. This is very important. Forget about what official bodies think or negotiate or not. The perception, the negative perception is there among Syrians, average Syrians. And this is what matters most because this is what's gonna stop any future dialogue. We understand that they don't have any more options with the regime, that they exhausted that channel. And now we understand that both sides, they have one way forward only, and that's an understanding. But really we have to change the narrative because there's no point of talking about violations that are happening in their areas. And this is perceived by all Syrians that I'm talking, even from the, the point of view of displaced people. Yes, there are people not being allowed to go back to their areas in the East. So I think we need to change that narrative because I agree with everyone, and this is crucial. The regime has not won. And this is not a, a romantic nor emotional, uh, no philosophical statement. It is pragmatic, it's on the grounds. The regime right now is frag fragmented. It has been disintegrated for a while. The regime is becoming more and more an unsustainable proposition for the Russians. So the key thing for us and for our allies as Syrian people is to keep the pressure. Our, one of our biggest uh, objectives for the coming months and years is to prevent the legitimization and the um, normalization with the regime. And I say that this issue of the victory narrative is very important because it's the premise for what kind of policies countries will do. Is it normalization or, it's more, or is it more pressure? Can we actually force the regime into negotiation and the Russians into negotiations or not? Because trust me, Clarissa, if the regime gets normalized, if the regime gets injection of support, financial and economic, there is no way that we will ever have any political solution or even negotiation. It is a tough decision and it has its collateral damage, of course, that will impact Syrians, but this is another issue that also needs to be handled on how to keep the pressure on the regime, but, but prevent or minimize the pressure, sorry, or the uh, collateral effects on, on Syrian people. But again, the regime has not won and we have, we still have an opportunity in the midst of all this grim reality that we, 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 we face and the price that we paid in terms of displacement, death, disappeared people, detainees, et cetera. But actually that price entitles us Syrians to demand and ask for the best kind of future for all our, our people. And talking about future, last sentence, the, the fastest way to change Syria, and I go back to what Rafif said, is to get the hundreds of thousands of young Syrians who have been displaced and have been exposed to new societies, to new cultures, that have acquired degrees, languages, experience, those young people can actually change the country, change Syria, if they are given the chance to go back to Syria in a safe environment that we Syrians define it ourselves. And, and Dr. Elshar, I hope that you can hear me again and I hope that your internet is going to allow you to, to weigh in on what Labib just said and, and give your perspective, not just on whether the regime has won, but does the regime feel that it's won? Does it feel that it has a sort of path forward? Yeah, I, I hear you very well. I don't think anyone has won in this uh, ugly war. That's, that's for sure. So um, it would be useless to talk about victory today because even if we claim it to be victory, it's a period victory. It's nothing really true at all about it. But let me, let me touch base on something. I think that we keep repeating it few cliches that we have you know, been forced to repeat for the last 10 years, and I would say the first one. In every meeting about Syria, especially with the countries involved, they come out of the meeting, and the first thing they think about, they talk about, is the Syrian unity, that Syria should be united, that Syria should stay united. Now, my question is, what is that unity if we have five armies on the Syrian sword today? 
What kind of unity are they talking about? This is really, it's becoming a fallacy. And this is something for some reason, some of us are convinced that this is the case. I think this is pretty much about a fallacy, it's something else. It's not true what they're saying about the unity of Syria. If they are really concerned, those parties involved about the unity of Syria, it's very simple. Just go out, leave Syria alone. Syria will be united without you. Syria today is not united because of you, because of your uh, presence in Syria. Five armies on one land. The other fallacy that we are, we have been, uh, I think it, it's been very deceptive and uh, that uh, in every meeting, everyone emphasizes that one of the solution for the Syrian catastrophe is Syrian, Syrian. That's what they're claiming, that Syrians have to decide their own destiny. We keep hearing that in every meeting. This is again a fallacy. In every meeting, those countries, when they meet together, there are no Syrians present. Take the meeting just last week. We Syrians are sitting in the corridors waiting to hear what had happened in those meetings and the results of those meetings. So what is this fallacy about us being involved in finding solution for our own country? What this, is, what, what this expression means that solution has to be Syrian, Syrian, if we are not involved. So within this environment, it, it's very hard for us Syrians to be really united and to be on one heart and really move and start to head into finding a solution for, for, the, for the disaster that we are doing. So if you look at the countries involved, if you take the US, for example, and the uh, uh, Europe, we, we see can pretty much describe their uh, action towards Syria as perfectly. It was like a pinprick actions. Nothing really was serious. It was all just, you know, on the peripherals, nothing really deep into the Syrian problem. So there are many factors playing, playing you know, uh, role into this case. But the, the most important thing today for us Syrians, uh, for the whole world to know that Syria today is broken. Syria, that beautiful nation it was, today it's broken and it needs fixing. And what, is it, what does it take to fix this broken machine? We are the best Syrian to sit down and come up with a list on how to fix Syria. One, two, three, four, five, six. We all know how to fix this country that has become broken today. But the question is, would the world listen to us? Would they keep their own self-serving interests aside a little bit so these Syrians come back to their lives? They can eat, they can live with dignity. These are the questions that we Syrians have not been able to answer. And unfortunately, the international community as well has not been able to answer. So we have to find a window somehow. Maybe if the Syrian elites got together and thought about it, maybe they will find a window to penetrate this, this block, you know, and come up with solutions. But I think we should not, uh, you know, blame ourselves too much because I think the international pressure on us is too much. You know, again, five armies in, in one, you know, geographical space. Um, I think we have lost you again, but I think you were in the course of, of making, a, you know, a very important point, which is on the limited capacity and control that Syrians have over the sort of outcome of what is happening in their own country because of all the international power brokers who are invested. Um, let me ask you, Rafif, something quickly because we're running out of time, uh, which I'm very conscious of, but I just wanted to ask you, is it possible to even have a conversation about, are, are you back again, Dr. Are you there? I know we've lost him again. Uh, Ravip, is it even possible to have a conversation about a united Syria or a future Syria or a solution to Syria as long as Bashar al-Assad is in power? Um, it, of course, it's possible to have a conversation. It's possible to think about it and it's possible to dream. But the reality is that there will not be a sustainable solution as long as Bashar al-Assad is in power whether he's propped up by Russia and Iran and other allies, 
or he, uh, he, he manages to stay on on his own. I think that's impossible. Uh, Syrians have made their demands known. They have been extremely clear. They have paid such a tremendous price to be free. I don't think it's possible for that to happen unless the regime collapses, unless there is a transitional framework put in place. And uh, probably with international monitoring, Syria can transition into a democratic framework that uh, reflects the ideals of all Syrians who have participated in this revolution. And Sinam, can I just ask you the same question very quickly because we're, we're, we're out of time, but is it possible to talk about a united Syria with Bashar al-Assad still in power? You know, <clears throat> the reality now he is in power. How can we make him, how can we empower ourselves? This is, we should think about it. As a Syrian opposition, as a Syrian democratic opposition, if we empower ourselves, if you are united, that time will be a, a powerful opposition to sit at the table with the regime and we can have a pressure on that, we can win. But now the regime is looking at the fragment, you know, the, the opposition is fragment, divided. So he's very happy with that. So what we need to unite ourselves as a Syrian people for the interest of the Syrian people and all the Syrian people, I'm not talking about the Kurds only, you know, so this is very important. We have to sit together, uh, talk, and I, I think uh, dialogue is the best solution now with the old Syrian uh, uh, division. This is very important, but still we need to have this unity in order to make Bashar, uh, you know, the regime, let us say, I don't care about the figures, but the regime itself that time you can change the regime. This is what we need. And of course, with the sponsor of the, uh, the, I mean, the uh, international committee with the United Nations, and this is what uh, should happen. Dr. Nadalashar, I don't know if you can hear me again, but just very quickly, we're at the end of our session, but do you believe that there can be a conversation about a united Syria with Bashar al-Assad in power? Can there ever be peace in Syria with him still in power? Well, that's, that's not really an easy question to answer because then this is pretty much an assumption. I think today we cannot afford working on assumptions. Uh, the issue today is to, to as uh, you know, with someone uh, to empower ourselves, to come together, to come to the table, and to forget about you know our differences. And here, I'm not saying to forgive because some crimes have been committed. You see, now well, these have to, you know people who committed these crimes have to be held accountable. But I, I think the issue of, of having one person who is the, the, the Bashar as a dominating scene, I think is not, is not really productive at all. There are so many other ways for us to work with from within. We don't have to focus on this one person. And then, you know, so this is, this is really a question that if you answer, you are in trouble. And if you do not answer, you are in trouble too. But we all know that there are 25 million Syrians today who are suffering and they have to come together and find a solution for that suffering. I'm not avoiding an answer, but I think an answer is not very productive at this point after the 20 years of suffering. Well, and maybe the, the, the non-answer in itself is an answer of sorts. And I'm very, very sorry that we have to finish here because this has been such a fascinating conversation, all of you offering such important and unique perspectives. And I'm really privileged to have participated in some small way. So thank you all for joining us. I know that you have another panel coming up in about 15 minutes or so. And thank you so much uh, to our wonderful panelists for sharing their expertise with us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.